Hey everybody, welcome back to Black Lotus, where we talk about all things strange and unusual. And if this is your first time here, I would highly encourage you to uh, take a look at some of our other videos and our other formats, uh, and you'll quickly realize that this is not normally what we do. We, uh, I'm in a, a, a essential business, what's considered essential, and that always makes me feel so important. <laughs> <laughs> and so business is a booming right now for me. So I don't have a lot of time to do the normal amount of research that we do. And we put a lot of research into our videos here. Um, and so when I don't want to dump all that on Ralph. And so uh, we are kind of taking a temporary hiatus. But uh, we didn't want our... Uh, subscribers to think that we've forgotten about them uh, and so what we do is we have another we have a podcast an actual like an audio podcast over at Podbean and it's called Paranormal News Network and what we do there is we report the latest in paranormal news and we also talk to some very interesting people and so what we've been doing is uh, kind of ripping the audio and putting it here uh, just so like I said you know that we didn't forget about you. Uh, but we are going to be getting back to our normal venue here pretty soon. And I'm thinking around maybe the beginning of July. And so, you know, definitely subscribe to us, uh, like our videos and subscribe. So you get not notified uh, as soon as we start doing that. Don't uh, forget to hit that bell. Yes, hit the bell so you get that notification. Um, but anyway, this week we had uh, Keith, Anth Anth excuse me, Keith Anthony uh, Blanchard on with us and he is an uh, alien and UFO experiencer and he has had many experiences and uh, they have profoundly changed his life uh, for the better actually uh, but anyway so that's what we're gonna do today we're gonna present that interview for you right about now Keith Anthony Blanchard is the author of a new book called Homecoming, Crossing the Bridge to the Soul. And he's also a man who claimed to have had deep, intense alien visitations and communication uh, that has profoundly affected his entire life and his view of the world. Hi, Keith. Welcome to Paranormal News Network. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me on this awesome platform. I love uh, hanging out with people like you. And uh, just letting go a little bit and getting wet, diving in really deep and seeing how far that bottomless pit goes. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, I think I want to jump in here real quick and just say, you know, first of all, tell us a little bit about, about yourself and also about your book. I am a full-time musician. I've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, early in my life, I had a girlfriend, I was a guitar player aspiring musician she was my shelter my transportation my intimacy my food she was all that and i was believe it or not a few years prior to that i was seriously thinking of becoming a catholic priest so i had the guitar dad gave me a guitar and had the girlfriend so god went in the closet <laughs> until many years later when i was in a dark night of the soul because of this relationship breakup i found myself pulling God out the closet slowly but surely saying, you know, I need to hear you, man. You know, this is this is not cool. All right, I get it. I put myself in the situation. Um, but I had so much passion, sincerity in my first asking, even though it took a month for what was to transpire to transpire. Um, I had so much fervor. I, I, I was broken. There was nothing else. And so in my lamenting for a month, though, like I said, it, it didn't take that. I wasn't not, it wasn't like I was trying to convince the absolute, okay, I believe that you're serious, now I'm going to pay you a visit. But three weeks later, after a night of playing music at a casino, uh, seven sets, it's just a grueling long day. Um, I go to bed, tired, dog tired, get home about four in the morning, trying to fall asleep from the long hike on the road. And about 6.30, 7 in that morning, um, I hear, good morning, Keith. Time for you to wake up. <laughs> so I look around the room. There's nobody there. My, my wife at the time uh, thought it was her. She came back in or a friend of mine that we were supposed to run some errands, helped himself in and woke my lazy ass up. And so I look around the room. There's nothing happening. So I thought, ah, oh, dream voice. No big deal. Dream voice. So I lay back in the bed with the intentions of going back to sleep. And the voice said, good morning, Keith. I asked you to awaken. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew something was happening. So I was laid back mm -hmm. gently. It, it was kind of a violent <laughs> thrown back on the bed. In, but 
at the same time, it was somewhat gentle. It was something that happened basically by uh, by default whenever such an energy spike would come in, at least into me. And I found myself standing in the only word I can use is presence. It was just completely present. It was so present. The way it spoke to me was not necessarily the Moses burning bush voice. It wasn't none of that. Um, it was, I can hear what it wanted. I could feel what it wanted. I could taste what it wanted. I could see what it wanted. It was truly everything imaginable. But the longer, the short of it is the voice begins to tell me uh, to sit on the sofa and press record. Now, keep in mind when this voice began to speak, it did not speak to me linearly thoughts that follow thoughts of fragmented thought. This okay. was whole thought. In this wholeness of thought was everything it wanted. It took my linear mind to imagine I was sitting there for a minute and a half having a time long with this intelligence. And so I go to the sofa and I press record on my tape player and my mouth begins to move. And it was not what I know is me doing it. So I logged this information for eight years, but more so really hard at it for the first year um, in meditation and writing, 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 writing. And I was told, okay, that's enough with the, uh, all this stuff, keep the formal stuff. Go out and live what you have been impregnated with and let your life experience be the glue that brings all this together so i basically didn't want to recite a whole bunch of stuff like a parrot and have no meaning and no umph and no experience behind it right and when that began to happen um i was getting visits and pfft, it's like opening the lines on the art bell show and everybody <laughs> trying to get in mm -hmm. i mean i had energies and entities from every possible level so i went through this process for many years and out of it came my bestseller, The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth. And then I went to India to see a holy man who came to me in a dream. I wrote another book called For the Love of God, uh, Spiritual Journey. And meeting Gavin, he said, Keith, compile some of your work. So I didn't say, hey, I got some fresh work. No, I just listened to what the universe said. And the universe through Gavin said, just put some books together from your previous stuff and paint a story of this unfoldment process. And so now uh, I am a soon to be released author with six books under John Hunt Publishing, uh, Homecoming, Crossing the Bridge to the Soul. And then at this time in my life, um, this is when all the extraterrestrial stuff began to open up as well. Okay, so I guess that leads me to my next question is, was that your first recollection of being with extra extraterrestrials? No, sir, when I was about eight years old, eight, nine years old, the first experience I had of anything was I was third person, third person observer, watching my eight-year-old self rise to the ceiling and float back into the body, rise <clears> to the <throat> ceiling and float back into the body. And I was pretty just happy being me rising as well as the observer, just watching this happen. But my first, and strangely or, or synchronistically, when I was about that age, I remember standing in a 200 foot pitch black backyard. This kid, you know, being raised Catholic, you know, had, had some residual fear of a boogeyman or the devil and whatever could be out there, big dogs. And, but I would find myself <laughs> at about 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the morning standing in the backyard and asking myself, what am I doing standing here in the backyard? But I would always look up. I would always look up. And <clears throat> the first night this happened, um, I was not tall enough to, uh, I'm five foot four now. So when I was eight, I was, I was like the run of the litter. Um, I, I, I looked around the backyard. Thank God there was, it was a full moon from what I can remember in a starry night. So there was some light. So I was looking around my backyard to find something to be tall enough. So I found a cinder block and I put the cinder block against the wall so I can lunge myself <laughs> into my bedroom. But this would happen off and on. <clears throat> twice a week, skip a week, once the next week, skip two weeks, three times. It was, it was at random. There was nothing, <clears throat> excuse me, there was nothing um, organized in the form of, well, Keith, expect tomorrow night at 1230. We're going to be right. up. It was none of that. And, but I never felt like something happened in a way that was just not cool and uh, I'm scared, mommy, daddy. None of that. I was never, ever, ever, ever in my li entire life experience even to this day, taken beyond my will, abducted, if you will, uh, violated in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But this period 
of being a little boy waking up in the backyard. It happened for about three years. And then I don't remember anything, nothing really. I don't remember anything. I just remember being in the backyard. But something, I knew there was a missing piece. Mm -hmm. Age 33, I'm watching the Discovery Channel, and I'm watching a program about aliens. And it all just came back. The who, the when, the why, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. where. So this is what started that whole process for me, this particular age. I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. Uh, the same thing happened to me, but I, I've only, to my knowledge, to my recollection, I've only been abducted the one time, and it was in 1988. I don't remember any of it until 1995 when I happened to be thumbing through one of those X-Files companion books. You know, it has stills from the series and stuff like that. And a friend of mine was trying to convince me that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the alien visitors are here. And up until that point, I was like, eh, you know, I, I don't disagree that there are aliens out there. I just don't think that they have any interest in us. Anyway, as I was thumbing through the book, there was a still of Fox Mulder reaching up into the sky and pointing at this triangular aircraft. And immediately I blacked out and was back in 1988 um, during this abduction. And I remembered almost the entire ordeal. Um, and then when I came to a couple minutes later, uh, my friend and my girlfriend at the time was, uh, they were standing over me and fanning and they're like, are you okay? And I said, you know, that's it. In that picture, that's it, but it's not it. It's a hell of a lot bigger than that. And what I saw was about the size of a football field. Um, you know, so, but yeah, I, 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 under, I completely understand what you're saying about that loss of memory and how just one thing will trigger it to call, all come all flooding back. That's fascinating. You used the word abduction. Did you, if I may ask you a question, did you feel like you, there was a contract you were supposed to be there? Or do you feel that, well, happened, that was not something that you wanted? Yeah, what happened with me um, uh, briefly is, is that um, I was living out of my car at the time and I was driving down this dark road, Highland Boulevard in Al Saloma, California. Um, <clears throat> and there was nothing but grape fields around there. And I came upon this huge craft and I was so mesmerized by it because they had these uh, like lights that were snaking underneath it. It was a triangular craft. And I was in a Hyundai GLS and I opened up my sunroof as my car stalled underneath it. And I crawled up out of the sunroof and was just gazing at this thing. And I felt a tap on my shoulder and this guy behind me says, sir, I'm gonna need you to sit down. And so I turned around and he looked like, you know, the typical man in black kind of thing. I mean, he had a dark suit on with a dark tie and white shirt, wow. and no, no sunglasses or a flashy thing, <laughs> anything like that. But um, <laughs> so, so I immediately complied because he seems to be some, somewhat of an authority figure. And so I, okay, well, I sat down and anyway, so he told me to get out of the car. He wanted to know what I was doing there. And I just told him I was trying to get to a place where I could sleep for the night because I was homeless. And uh, he, so he told me to get out of the car. And when I got out of the car, that's when I noticed this creature standing next to him. And it, it, the creature was like one of those, uh, you know, the typical gray that you, you see in uh, depictions. Um, and anyway, there was some sort of telepathic communication between the alien and him. And he says, they want to take you aboard. And I said, aboard that? I don't want to go aboard that. Said, Look, just let me go. And I won't say a word about what you're doing. I have no idea what's going on. He says, well, you know, it's a little late for that. And so um, so I was very uh, trepidatious about doing this. And the creature came out and touched my hand. And immediately, all anxiety went away. And so we stepped out into the middle of this grape field underneath this craft. And I don't know how we got on there. But next thing I know, I was lying on a slab. So... Yeah, so I, was there some sort of contract? I don't know. I just know that the, when the creature touched me, I mean, like I said, all anxiety went away, and I just went, all right, I'll just roll with it, you know? Wow, wow, wow. Powerful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was kind of crazy. Cosmic. Did you did you, did you you find that the aliens you encountered were friendly? Every single one. Really? Now, I, I am not saying there aren't. It's not a mixed bag of tricks. 
um, you know, we got that on the earth. We have great, be beautiful human beings and we got beautiful human beings who do just a bu bunch of ridiculous stuff. Mm -hmm. um, my experience, well, I, I can say, you know, technically, yes, but no. You know, if we want to, being raised Catholic, if we want to call these demonic forces, or even if it's just a muddled monkey mind that everyone has that creates these things in the moment, whatever it is, I did have experiences in that way with bad beings, but they were more of a bad spiritual nature versus bad extraterrestrial nature. But if that's what the demons are spoken of in scripture, well, then they're not of the earth as humans as we know it to be. So they are in some way extraterrestrial. But as far as the ET alien thing, um, I, I've never, never, not once, not even glimpsed. Actually, I'll take that back. I had one experience some years ago with a royal white. Okay. And we were in some place, just a place, um, and there was also a triangle-headed a triangle -headed being. Now, whether this is real from Corey Good, because there's a lot of disturbances around Corey, nothing against Corey, I don't care about that. All I know is what I experienced in his sleepscape was a triangle-headed being and a royal white. And when I saw him, I went into my spiritual protect Keith Blanchard mantra. And he says, if <laughs> he says, you and I's path should never cross again. I will not be the same energy the next time. And it was a royal white. He was looking directly in my eyes. And I, I didn't combat it. I didn't give it any fear, any power. I was just like, I understand. <laughs> what, what, what do you think that he meant by that? I don't like you. Because, yeah. because I was using a very old sacred spiritual mantra as a way of protecting myself from his energy. So in truth, what happened was I'm taking my fear as to why I thought that I needed to protect myself with this raw ancient mantra, and I'm projecting my script onto him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, all right, you know, it's just like a dog. A dog can sense, you know, your issues, your trouble. And so the dog becomes frightened. Well, I'm not, <laughs> uh, it was sort of the same idea, but most of my experiences have been very high, highly evolved extraterrestrials as they begin to open, as they begin to overlap the higher spiritual dimensions, they can't really get to the highest spiritual dimension as human can, but they are actually crossing that bridge to the threshold of being divine. Mm -hmm. It's only through human birth that we can actually aspire to God. In fact, that's why every creature on every possible dimension is interested in the earth and its happenings because we are the first, we are the pinnacle of creation, having the the opportunity, the doorway to open up inside of all of us to embody that very prophecy of heaven on earth. So everyone's interested. Everyone wants to know what this is about. Well, that's, that brings me to a good question is what do you think the reason for your contact with these extraterrestrials is? I believe early in my life at the eight, nine, 10 year old, time when I was having those backyard experiences was they were picking me up, asking me to go to dinner with them or however you want to see, because the word abduction does not apply here at all. I wouldn't even say the word taken, maybe taken. Uh, they picked me up and took me somewhere <laughs> kind of thing. But I think at that period of my life was to manipulate my energetic system or smooth it out or to impregnate me with codes or seeds or whatever it may be. I think that was my preparation, my, my initiation. At the age of 33, when I had the blackout and then I saw the discovery program, that began my initiation period for me. And now I believe I'm starting to at least knock on the door uh, to cross the threshold. Um, I, think, I think there was a gradation, uh, an order of the way my life ha was to play out so I can prepare myself for the work that I do now. What um, what was it like to be aboard the ship that you were on? Um, uh, the, I, I, I'm kind of get, getting the feeling that the extraterrestrials you dealt with were not necessarily the extraterrestrials I dealt with. Uh, on the other hand, I did have one one encounter during that uh, uh, period uh, that time that I was taken with um, with a, a tall white. Um, but otherwise, all the other aliens were the typical small gray aliens. Um, I'm assuming that um, the aliens you dealt with weren't necessarily like that. No, um, I had experiences. 
you know, when I had the uh, the earlier experiences in my 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 uh, preteens, I don't really remember faces. I remember impressions. I remember energies. And if I can choose, if I was to choose uh, one out of my mind, I may erroneously grab a gray or a Pleiadian or something like that. So, in, in, in fact, that's just really uh, irrelevant, at least for me. But <clears throat> the, later in my life, uh, one of the first groups, uh, I used to have a, a spiritual sister, if you will. She is Pleiadian, and her name was Beck, and she always made it a point to tell me how to spell her name. And it wasn't B E K, it wasn't B E C K, it was B E Q. She's, <laughs> and she would come over to me in the middle in the morning hours and start poke, literally poking me in my ribs and making fun of me as a sibling, uh, loving, loving rivalry between brother and sister would be. Uh, I remember having a visit from the Clarions, and this little girl, looks to be about a seven-year-old little girl, was, I wouldn't say the queen, it implies hive mind, it wasn't that at all, this was very spiritual, and um, she was just the commander, <laughs> she was in charge of the whole thing, but in mm. her little bodiness, there was a great power, uh, a, an innocent wisdom. Now, this is where I go to the personal physical experience I had ongoingly for about four and a half to five years. I was going to a spiritual metaphysical, a metaphysical church every other Sunday called the Connection Center here in Memphis. And a friend of mine, as we're waiting in line to go into the assembly, um, she comes bouncing down the, the aisle and hey, Keith, and she's always goofy, right? And uh, she says, do you want to meet an alien? And I thought she was being goofy, and she was. She was actually being goofy about it. And I can say, I could tell something was different. I said, uh, sure. She said, follow me. <laughs> so I walked behind her, and she brought me up to the backside of this five foot one woman. And Laura says, Keith, meet Nucleus 8. Nucleus 8, meet Keith Blanchard. When this five foot woman turned around, the voice that came out of her was not human. It was, th this, in fact, a woman of that stature and size does not have the vo vocal cord capacity <laughs> to, to sound like this. Um, and, it, and the first thing, as we shook, motioned to shake hands, it said to me was, what do you want from me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is that? I mean, how, how, you know, you're expecting, oh, hi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Uh, and I, I was taken back. And he says, you want some help with that? And I said, yeah. He says, you want data. He didn't say friendship. Can I buy you some coffee? He said, you want data. And I was still beside myself and he started laughing. He, she. The woman is named Morgie. Her, her spiritual name is Star One. She's five foot one. The energy that came out of this woman is seven foot tall. He's a, a, an alien human hybrid. His name is Nucleus Eight. His name is Nucleus Eight is because he was grown grown with the purpose of becoming the lord of security for this quadrant of the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. He's 4,000, <clears> when I knew him in 97, when I met him in 97, he was 4,720 years old. Their technology is such that when, before you die, they can rejuvenate you half of whatever time you were going to die. And then when you're ill again or whatever the reasons provided you don't get your head cut off, um, they can rejuvenate you half that time. So Nucleus was in his was in his first cycle. He was 4,720. That was 22 years ago. Math, 4,742. Um, but I befriended this being these people for five years. And how this all happened for the woman was when she was young, she was went through a lot of abuse, and she went to see a psychiatrist psychologist, a friend of mine by the name of Dr. Rex here. And though she was his patient over quite a few years, they developed a relationship. But the very first day she went to see Dr. Rex here, who has five books on all of this, his 15 years with her, and they're all free. Um, working with her, when he put her under a light regression just to see what's happening so he can be the doctor he is to help her, the first thing that happened was the entrance of a fairy by the name Perithnia. 
And she tells Dr. Rex there, if you think you're going to come in here and monkey with her mind, I'm going to stop you myself. Mm -hmm. And so this whole process of fairies, uh, archangelic beings, angelic beings, shamans, and then nucleus finally shows up. Nucleus is an alien human hybrid, seven foot tall. His skin is milky white. His hair looks like dreadlocks, but it's milky white. He has alien eyes. Damien, about the size of your glasses that I see in this profile pic, it's not the huge gray alien almond black shape eye. They're, they're more like human size. Um, I would love to send you a picture, and you're welcome to share that with your listening audience of what he looks like. But <clears throat> after he began to work with Star One, um, I, sh I met them shortly after. He was able to do the most phenomenal things to through with me in front of me, literally grabbing my hand and pulling me out of my body in waking states of consciousness. So there are all these stories. So Nucleus 8, uh, he has uh, six digits on each hand and foot. Um, his mother was a gray alien. His father was an Egyptian king. His name is Nucleus because he was grown for to be the head of security, the center of security. And his name is eight because he is number eight on the board of 12. He lives on a starship, uh, a mothership station, 27,000 light years away from here in another dimension. And you've seen him more than once or just this one time? I've, I've hung out with Rex and Morgie for many, many times. They lived uh, near Memphis. So they would come to, to town every other week and we'd have church service. And Nucleus 8 and I were also, a, we had a very pr phenomenal friendship. Um, but again, people think would think that, well, this is just a woman channeling or no, 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 this is not that. This is super, truly not that. This is not someone who walks around with an open eye channeling session with this being. No, no, no. Nucleus was able did truly superimpose himself into her auric field and basically was manipulating. I mean, that, that's who he was. He was the one owning the body in that moment. She would go elsewhere in a solar system and hang out with some galactic friends and have supper or do it in that part of the galaxy. So uh, there are so many stories um, I can tell you. Um, he, Nucleus and his team, they do travel uh, this quadrant of the galaxy, policing it, keeping out fear um, and riffraff, if you will, just like we do here on Earth. Um, they help stars to be born. And one thing I would like to say before I, I take a pause, <laughs> when I get into this role, it's like I start going back into memory. On their planetary station, the way they supply the entire system with power is they have what we would call Buddhist monks, but their version of it, all meditating their energy into the core of the entire station. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Why do you think that that is? Free energy, Buddhist okay. monks. We okay. the vibration to keep. Well, not only does it supply light and energy to the station as far as the physical capacity of having such things for technologies that they need, light, air, whatever it is that they need there, but also to keep the vibration um high uh the consciousness high so that their vibrational place in the universe is is steady and stable and it doesn't fall into a lower vibrational bandwidth where knuckleheaded nonsense like so these draconians can make become visible to them and so i, I see it as a multifaceted uh, purpose yeah we uh we've had a few guests uh with us on the podcast um who have claimed that uh, in fact the very last one we did was with uh, Richard and Linda Smith, and uh, they have no, had known each other their entire lives since she was like 11 and he was like, I think, eight. And she was, they were both aboard these, these, this craft and they were repeatedly taken. Um, and she was actually working for uh, the aliens and she was charged um, with watching over the young Richard. And they basically told her, whatever you do in life, don't let anything happen to him. Well, I'll flash fo forward to many, many years later, um, neither one of them really had that much uh, memory of this stuff. 
and um, she met him at a uh, uh, one of his art show openings, a gallery opening, and um, she said that there was an instant connection between the two of them. And so flash forward even more, and she they eventually get married. Uh, even though when they first met, uh, she, she was married to somebody else and she was very pregnant. Um, and they believe that he was actually the father of that child that she was pregnant with. And it was a, they were actually twins. One was taken from them to be raised in space and the other one was left behind to be raised by them. And anyway, so... I, I guess what I'm leading up to is what are your thoughts on star children? Uh, do you think that this is part of this so-called alien agenda? Laura, the lady who introduced my friend, who introduced me to Nucleus 8, though it was a woman who was married to the psychologist, you know, he even invited some of his colleagues, his peers, into the room with him one day. He says, guys, I need your help. After 30 minute session, they walked out of the room and said, Rex, you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> and so, the, the Nucleus 8, the male energy that worked through Star 1, he married my friend Laura on his planetary station, and they had three children. Okay. So, yes, I would totally agree with Star Children in that regard. But also, we can with a lot of people associate Star Children. You know, someone has a, a beautiful young child that's very bright-eyed, and there's a magic there, and everybody can see it. That's a magic. We call that naturally a Star Child. Uh, because they come from the Syrian, Pleiades, uh, whatever. At least that's what the pseudo-spiritual field or arena plays with the idea. Well, this person is a star child. But I think you mean star child. Do you mean crossbreeding between them and us? That, that too. Uh, in the case of Richard and Linda Smith, uh, the child that was taken from them to be raised in space was actually a human child, not a hybrid. But that leads me to my next question about that, about uh, what are your thoughts on hybrid children? That would be the human race. That's exactly what we are. But speaking about present day, but in the days of yore, when this all started to happen, the human being is DNA, RNA encoded with advanced civilizations from around the universe. There's probably like between seven and nine, and probably everybody in between had a little, little dip out of the saucepan and or an added something else, another ingredient into it. Hence, we enter into the arena of, uh, you know, demonic possession or anything that would lead into that field. You know, everybody wants to be into the human experience because, like I said earlier, this is the first time this has ever happened. But we are star children. We, we are hybrids, actually. But as far as today, oh, yeah, I have no doubt. They, if you, I, I, there's a language that exists beyond English or whatever your native tongue is. And it's called shh. And in between all the notes and all the noise in that silence, doing what I do as a, a practitioner of consciousness of in, in energy, I see something that does not look like the normal movement of things. And so likewise, if we have the ability of sight to know how the human being truly walks, talks, acts, and behaves. Let's call that the, the, the mass. No, no right, wrong, and out who's better or worse, none of that. But just the acts of the average human being. When someone walks through a crowd and they have a different gait, a different cadence, a different way about them, one, it catches your attention. But if you can relax into the experience of why it got your attention, then you may start seeing some features before uh, that, that you couldn't see before. They start to pop out. And then you notice what well, their eyes look just a little different. Well, of course, everybody has different eyes. But, you know, you start to start seeing these signs. So I think they are not only among us. I think um, they're populating the earth quite well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I think I think both, I, I speak for both Ralph and myself when, we, when, when I say that we completely agree with you that uh, uh, that alien DNA was injected into us long ago, and uh, you know, and so it had it made us evolve into what we are today. Do you think that the modern plan is to further evolve us? Uh, 
I guess modern would be which side the fence one finds home base. Well, I mean, what I guess what I'm saying is, is do you think that these hybrids that they are basically raising in space and oh, are I see, they I then see. sending them to Earth to further uh, evolve the human race? Yes, I see. I, I thought we were speaking about the establishment. My apologies. Yeah, absolutely. Because when we win, they win. Because remember, at least what I mentioned earlier was everyone wants a piece of the human rock star action. All the world's a stage. So to help us further this divine plan and the intellectual ones know it, that's why they come here. They want to watch this awesome movie that came out Thursday night and everyone said, oh my God, you got to go see the new Star Wars. So they're coming here and they're waiting in line. They want to get a gl at least a glimpse. And they also want to support because in so doing, it brings them up another vibrational rung of the ladder by their participation and contribution so that possibly in a future incarnation, they could become the very human being that we are to reach the pinnacle of creation itself, which is the heaven prophecy, as we find ourselves in these meat suits planted in the earth. So we get to live into the infinity of it. That's what this is all about. This is what it's always been about. Um, but now the flower is starting to open. And so 2020, two doors, but it's actually really one door. That one door will take us either f exponentially into a place that's not fun, or the, uh, the other door would take us exponentially into a divine sacred space, which is everything anyone could possibly imagine. So what does that world look like? It looks like you. It looks like nothing. There's nothing in that world. And in the nothingness of that world lies absolute infinite potential. That is what is referred to as the kingdom of the garden, the place, the God gate, the place where everything that can possibly happen, that can mean anything at all is. That's the whole unfoldment of why we are so important. You, you, I, I think you're reading my mind. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's been preying my mind recently is all this, and and I, we don't get into political stuff here, so don't take take it this way, please. But yay, um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a break away from that. But with all the political and social upheaval that's happening right now, I'm very curious as to know if this this evolvement if you will uh is is the reason for that because anytime there is change there's 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 spark against that change which causes problems and i'm wondering if this uh, uh alien hybrid program to enhance our invol our involvement has anything to do with that fantastic yeah, um, this upheaval in the world. What I am going to say, many listeners may not like it. Congratulations, I got your attention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ask that you like it. I ask that you hear it. Actually, rather, I want you to feel it, how it tastes in your mouth, your spiritual metaphorical mouth. What is happening on the world is the collective karma is being revealed for all to see. No one is exempt. The upheaval in the world, the people that are dying, be it the police officers and the protesters, this is all karmically balanced. This is all on purpose. So what we can do to place ourselves in the garden, in the nothing, which is the everything, is to get out of the fight, get out of being anti-racist, get out of anti-terrorism, get out of bickering. It's all an internal noise. It's all an internal bickering. Mm -hmm. And so the alien involvement is they can't just show up and say, we are here. It's, it's against universal law. You can't flout universal law like that. And they know it because what they're trying to do is go up another vibrational rung, not go down. And to make such an assertion, what put them in the place that is not beneficial to their agenda. Their agenda, they don't really have an agenda. The ones that are highly evolved and intellectual and intelligent, they really don't have the feeling capacity. Their, their intellect supersedes feeling capacity. We are of the denser vibration as to why we're able to have the density of feeling, which is very much more dense than spiritual intuition kind of thing. 
but their involvement truly is to be active participants for sure, but somewhat behind the scenes, hiding behind clouds, making appearances to those who are able to see, who want to see, slowly but surely they are becoming present. I do agree also with the fact that there are beings living here, positive and negative ones. We can look out and we can call it the cabal or whatever, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. There are beings here that are not human interests. So obviously this would be alien to that which is human. Right. But I think we also have some beautiful beings on the earth. Uh, I, I met many of them um, from India, the ones I've met from India, but also from the celestial realms, gods, if you will, literally gods. And one of them I see twice a year. Um, I'm a disciple of his. His name is Swamji Viswayogi. He's God on earth. He was the first God realized man to walk on the planet thousands of years ago. This is his ninth incarnation and he's here to liberate the world. But yes, I, I think that there's so much involvement from even realities we don't know exist. We know aliens and extraterrestrials, celestials and fairies. And what about these things that we have yet to build? The, the ability to simply take in that they're salivating at the mouth like everybody else about this change that's afoot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the, uh, what uh, other people call the masters. Yeah, the ascended yeah. masters. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we talked to one other gentleman who was uh, involved with that, and he was a pretty fascinating guy and what he said about them. But um, so one last question here is, you know, all this uh, uh, hubbub about the Navy releasing videos of this Tic Tac UFO and all that stuff. And um, do you think that those UFOs that they, the, the tapes of these UFOs that they're releasing, are they actually alien or do you think that they are man-made? If they are alien, why are they releasing this now? I am very much aware that we have gleaned, my son and I watched a movie, a show today with Bob Lazar. Yes. So I'm very much aware of the reverse engineering and we have, you know, frick, in the late 37s or the 40s, the Germans were hanging out with the Dracos and they had the German bell. Uh -huh, so right. if they can do that, then, you know, I, I have no doubt by now, you know, hello, Area 51 or Groom Lake or maybe whatever. There's technology that exists, but I absolutely uh, know that um, these crafts that are appearing, the one reason we are able to capture them, I think this is part of your question that you're asking of me, um, was, you know, why now and how 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 is this happening? Well, they are allowing us to see them. We can't see them without them them wanting us to. For God's sakes, they hide behind clouds or are the clouds or look like clouds or so these these master beings, if you will, like you said. Um, so why now? Why now? Why? Because it's time. They have been given permission from the higher ups. From the higher ups. Now's the time. Okay, slowly start. Be the reconnaissance team. Go out. Start investigating. Start making your presence known. Da 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 da. Um, we're ready. We're ready. The world is starving. There, we're longing for something, and many people may not know that what it is they're longing for, but we can see it in their eyes. We can see yep. it. It's it's apparent. This upheaval, this arising anarchy, not good. Arising upheaval, toss on a few tables. All right, you made your point. <laughs> but I think it's all purposeful because the people that have karmic debt to pay for everyone else who is a little more karmically free can witness and respond accordingly so that they can become the meek and raise their offspring to be even meeker and then their offspring to be the meekest. And so, yeah, uh, I think there's so much involvement. And I think why now is because it's time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Ralph, did you have any other questions? I just wanted to know uh, when's the last time you had uh, been, well, you say not abducted, that you've actually been with them. I, yeah, thank you. I like the way you put that. Thank you. I call it being with others. It, let, me see, let, me, let me actually pause for a second. This happened probably a month ago. And to give you an overview of what my experiences are like now, humans occupy local space. There are a lot of humans aboard these craft. There's a lot of human hybrids aboard these craft. There's a lot of completely extraterrestrial aboard these craft. These beings, these craft that I've been on, mostly house children. 
<laughs> except for the adults that are holding it all together and being the commanders of the said ship. When I was hanging out with Nucleus 8, they, he gave me an implant. He calls me one day, you want an implant? Everyone has one but you. They're smaller than you can see. I make them myself. There's only one left. I said, what convinced me I want it? He says, if you're lost, we can find you. If you're in trouble, we can help you. And if you're sick, we can administer medicine. And he named the one drawback. And I said, what's that? He said, your life is no longer private. He says, you have anything you're ashamed of? I said, no. He said, all right, next time we speak, this will be implanted. So I go to the casino. I play music. <laughs> come back. Dog tired. I find myself in a space of full-blown consciousness in my sleepscape because of this excruciating pain in my right kidney region. And I look over my right shoulder to see where's the source of this pain? What this is, who's do, who or what is doing this? And there's an equivalent of, because Nucleus was 4,720 years old, to us that would look like a 45-year-old man. Mm -hmm. So this lady being was about 85 to you and I, so she had to be whatever plus 1,000 years old. And as she's carrying me while I'm in this excruciating pain, she's going telepathically telling me, silly boy, you went into this with some understanding that it was going to be painful and you made yourself right. <laughs> so as I'm in this bout of pain, she brings me over to him. Which he was sitting in what we would call a lawn chair type thing. And I begin to vomit on his feet. And <laughs> my phone in my bedroom rings. And guess who's on the phone? And it's Nucleus 8. He says, hey, dude. <laughs> I said, dude, I just had a, I had a dream about you. He says, no, you didn't. I said, bro, I, I just came out of my sleep. I know I had a dream about you. He says, Keith, you are not dreaming. I said, are you sure? He says, the vomit all over my feet. <laughs> and so after not talking to him for 14 years of all places, he found me on Facebook. Really? He's, yes. He sends me an inbox message. And I interviewed the doctor. When I got my, did my first radio show on Inception Radio Network, the next day he says, hey, Keith, how about letting an old man in your center of light room? This is Frank. I said, who? Do you know Dr. Hare? He said, Keith, this is Nucleus 8. You better be jumping up and down. So my first time of seeing him after all this time, he said, do you want me to tweak your implant? I said, sure. He says, all right. So knowing him, I knew it was going to happen that night. I find myself aboard a craft. And this is going to answer your question, Ralph. Or, and I, I, I was aboard a craft. And as I'm in the craft, I'm standing in front of what looks like a living room. They, it, it looked a little futuristic and a little Futurama, but it was a living room. And there were these children <laughs> everywhere. It was all about the children. And I raised my hand. Uh, I said, everyone raise your hand who has seen me here before. And everyone raised their hand except a table over here, about eight. And I laid down. I was I went unconscious and I'm on my back. And when it came to a state of consciousness, again, it was like zip and zip. Nucleus eight is looking over me because I'm laying on my back and all these children, just all these children. And so they tweaked my implant. We're walking down this corridor. I'm being ushered by this person I can see peripherally. And they're holding my elbow, and I feel this pain quickly in my right arm. I say, you're administering that implant, aren't you? She said, yes, Mr. Blanchard. <laughs> but these spaceship, a lot of it is futuristic Star trek -y. But it's truly just living quarters like our own. Interesting. And one thing that makes everything familiar is the presence of these children there's always this innocent curious wonderment awe bounce around like a fresh little kitty energy it's there's this little hyper innocent thing and i swear to you out of all of my experiences that energy of innocence wonderment awe curiosity like a, a whole bunch of children playing in a room just letting go is sort of what drives everything, including the universe. It's like the entire universe, a spaceship, our lives. These are all just furnaces and engines that are just burning and combusting. Actually, to go back to that very quality as to why those children or priority aboard these craft, it's all about the children.
I, 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 I find that interesting. Uh, like I said, we just talked to uh, Richard and Linda uh, Smith, and uh, as I mentioned, they met when she was like 11, and she talked about all these children on the ship, and that they actually had like classrooms, and she was in charge of one of the classrooms. Um, do you recall anything like that, where the children are being taught? Mm, I, it does make sense to me. Energetically, I can feel that. I would say also, not, I'm sure they're being taught, but I see them more of in roles of being teacher, okay. simply by their being. And so, I, I, but I think I think it's a shake hands deal. Oh, but it's truly for these extraterrestrials, ultra terrestrials. It's all about learning. Again, that's why they are here. That's why we're here. We are learning. We are learning how to, we humans, we are learning how to do this so that the future scripture will be talked when it will be talking about us, the hero. So these extraterrestrials are all about some learning. They are here to learn the, uh, beyond the capacity of what they have. They don't understand what feeling is. They may understand it energetically, but you can't just take a bunch of human emotions and put it into their belly and say, this is what I'm trying to tell you what it feels like to be me. It can't happen. As to why we've had some of these abductions where they would impregnate mom with a hybrid seed and they separate them for a while, see how the child responds, how the mother responds reunites them together and the love that happens oh my god i remember my mother oh my god i remember my child that spark of power is what they are scientifically exploring because they don't understand what that is because they don't have the capacity as to why we as humans our scientists explore further into space because they want to learn something that is just outside of their bandwidth capacity so yeah, the universe is always turning within itself like feedback and expanding into greater possibilities. Possibilities. It's always about infinite possibility. Keith, it is it has been fascinating talking with you. Um, I'm I'm always really interested in talking to other people who have been experiencers like me. Um, and uh, I have to say, a lot of what you say resonates with me. I, I completely uh, agree with you on a lot of this stuff. Um, before we get out of here, though, you are also a talk show host. Um, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? You can find me at centeroflightradio.com or keithanthonyblanchard.com, same website. I've been doing radio for about nine and a half, possibly 10 years. Uh, I do a live presentation almost every night, let's say four, three, four nights a week. Uh, you can find that at Keith Anthony, excuse me, Facebook.com slash Keith Anthony Blanchard. As a spiritual teacher, I find a title. Simply, I can make one up, and that's all I need. And I just lean into these intuitive teachings that come from uh, this present these presentations. You can find me on YouTube, YouTube.com slash Center of Light Radio. I just love what I do. I love being with people. I love educating. I love learning. And I've learned, one thing I've learned since we're speaking about learning, one thing I've learned is that there's nothing you have to do. There's really nothing you have to learn. And in the letting go of having to have a something to complete you, packets of light, extraterrestrials, angelic beings begin to show up with gifts and favor to say, ah, We've been waiting for an eternity to give you this thing, because when you in, initiate this thing, integrate this thing, and graduate into this thing, we all win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't disagree with you, definitely. Right. Keith, thanks a lot for being on the show. Uh, I, please keep us in mind to be on future uh, uh, episodes with us. I would love would. to, thank you. And I, also in closing, if I may, um, my book, Homecoming, Crossing to the Bridge to the Soul, which is my bestseller, as well as my book about my journey to India to see a divine God man, um, sandwiched into a spiritual sandwich. Um, you can go pre-order that now at uh, Amazon.com. Homecoming, Crossing the Bridge to the Soul, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it.
thank you.